this is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from sunny Miami. Today we have the pleasure of having uh, Thomas Hedberg and Elliot Noma from the IMCRA Association uh, associated with the United Nations. Uh, they're doing great work uh, bringing in telemedicine to areas of disaster and they're going to talk all about that. We're also joined by uh, four distinguished panelists and we'll start with the owner of Medgadget with whom we're collaborating to uh, bring you this uh, telecast. Hello, Gene. Hi, I'm Gene Ostrovsky. I'm the managing editor of Medgadget. Uh, welcome, everybody. I hope we have a great discussion. Very good. It's being broadcast, by the way, on medgadget.com. And uh, Mohammed, good day. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Mohammed. Uh, I'm a research fellow at Mass General Hospital uh, in Boston. Uh, and I'm uh, working on telemedicine in Libya. So it's a pleasure to meet you all. It's a pretty exciting uh, project. Hello, Roger. Hello, everyone. I'm Roger Santos. Uh, I'm a telemedicine consultant, uh, about 10 years in the field, um, UC Davis and uh, Providence Health and Services uh, as uh, project management and, and delivery. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Well, welcome, Roger. And uh, Simon. Hello everyone, my name is Simon. I'm in uh, Tokyo, Japan. I'm a clinical psychologist and a medical student. I'm very, very interested in uh, telemedicine. Thank you very much. Hey, welcome, Simon. Okay, Thomas and Elliot, it's your show. Go ahead. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for hosting us. We certainly appreciate the recognition of the work that MCRA has been doing. Uh, I can give you a little bit of background. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Elliot Noma. Uh, my background is neurophysiology primarily. I'm adjunct faculty at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York in the Department of Neuropsychology. Elliot? Uh, I'm Elliot Noma. I am uh, have a PhD in psychology. I'm also going to be an adjunct professor at Rutgers University this fall. About three years ago, uh, really in direct response to the multiple uh, tripartite disaster in Tohoku, Japan, the earthquake, tsunami, and subsequent radiation spill. Um, IMCRA, which was in its nascent uh, form at that point, was contacted by OCHA, the United Nations Office of Coordinated Humanitarian Associations, and asked to bring some of its uh, uh, online streaming video module technology to bear uh, to answer an unmet need in that area, which was uh, basically remedial medical education. And to explain that a little bit better, um, there were, as you know, uh, on the 11th of March in 2011, uh, the uh, eastern coast of Japan, the Tohoku area, was uh, basically inundated by a triple disaster, uh, a, a tsunami uh, which followed a very severe earthquake and which was then followed by a radiation spill. As a consequence, of this disaster, in addition to the uh, very severe loss of life in that area, uh, a lot of the healthcare providers, uh, quite frankly, in Tohoku were also among the dead and missing. And uh, we were left with a, uh, a large uh, influx of patients, survivors, who uh, were essentially inundating the um, remaining healthcare providers, and many of the healthcare providers that were left. Uh, were refugees and victims themselves, on top of which they weren't necessarily trained in the areas that were needed at that time. So uh, we like to give this one example. We had one situation uh, near Kesanuma uh, and also in the small city of Miyako where we had uh, uh, 200 patients uh, being seen by one physician who was trained as a cosmetic dermatologist and he was sitting, uh, seeing cases of compound fractures and uh, impacted bowels and uh, respiratory uh, issues that he simply wasn't trained in. So what IMCRA was able to do was to access medical talent in New York, uh, basically uh, comprising Japanese-speaking physicians who were expert in a number of different therapeutic areas. And we were able to record uh, 8 to 12 minute video modules with instruction on how to uh, treat patients that were uh, suffering from a number of different ailments within a given therapeutic area and post these via GP3 system that could end on the internet that could be picked up in uh, areas that were very severely hit. 
And uh, what we found was that this um, service was wildly appreciated. We had, uh, we were shocked uh, over 10,000 hits on the site just from not only from physicians who were trying to access the expert, the native language expertise uh, that was available through IMCRA, but also uh, from uh, other healthcare providers, social workers, psychologists, and other people who were trying to organize and uh, advise uh, the, the vast number of survivors who were essentially homeless and uh, without a place to turn on what to do next. So that was the um, founding impetus for uh, IMPRA. We essentially found that there was so much interest and so much utility from the system that we then began to apply it elsewhere in the world. But the concentration uh, primarily in uh, West Africa during the Ebola crisis and also in uh, East Asia. Uh, uh, currently we've got about six or seven programs ongoing in various areas as well as a domestic program in the U.S. Um, relating to uh, remedial uh, education uh, for um, primary care physicians treating cases of PTSD and TBI in returning veterans. Well, one of the things that makes us very excited is the fact that you're talking about several years ago in terms of the use of video. Video has only gotten more and more exciting, more powerful, better distribution over time, and we anticipate continued growth. Um, can you, can you, uh, go ahead, Gene, go ahead. I was wondering, so what, what kind of software do you use for, uh, for uh, do you use just Skype, readily available stuff that people can just uh, use right away? Well, essentially, our uh, current uh, repository is VZAR. Uh, we use the VZAR system to uh, store videos and to uh, place text online. And then subsequently, we use a, uh, actually, we're changing uh, uh, platforms for distribution right now. But I think Elliot can right. speak it's, to it's, that it's, in it's, very uh, detail. It's relatively generic. We use Node.js uh, as the main uh, server-side platform. But it becomes just a regular web platform. It can be viewed through any any web browser and just intermediates wherever the videos are served from. Yeah, and uh, again, one of the reasons we try to keep this as uncomplicated as possible is because this is a free access service. There are two components to it. There is a registered access, which is a little bit different, but um, the majority of what we make available is free instantaneous access with interactive components. Uh, meaning that uh, the actual presentation is not only the video, but we have a function uh, to enable users to download relevant materials as PDFs, some of these being scientific articles, some of them being popular articles, some of them being uh, therapeutic guides, as well as being able to query the faculty member directly in their native language and receive a response. Have you, um, have you done any interaction directly between provider, doctor, and these remote locations, or has this all been just uh, pre-recorded modules? No. We, um, to answer the question most precisely, we have, uh, since we began, sent teams to the areas that uh, we serve as a general rule so that we have made sure, absolutely certain, to interact with users so that we can keep the system updated and uh, functioning at uh, maximum utility. In other words, we don't want to be just generating uh, educational material unless we know that there is a, uh, a real need for it in the areas that we're serving. Right, and this is one advantage in terms of having our, having our own website, in terms of our ability to, to uh, monitor what's going on, monitor the usage, sort of understand who's using it, and to make improvements as needed. And the videos are in, are in the native language of Japanese, right? Well, what we've tried to do is, in each case, provide an English as well as a native language version. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, the, this is kind of important because a lot of the people that we have access as faculty are experts, are globally recognized experts in their particular areas. And um, we want to have their uh, modules available. Uh, again, you know, if we are not accessing an area that we are have someone who's proficient in the language in, we will then issue the module and make the module available in English. Uh, at present, our modules are available in, here we go, in <laughs> Hindi, 
in um, Nepalese, in uh, Japanese, in Chinese, in Thai, uh, in Vietnamese, in uh, Bahasa Indonesia, uh, in U.S., uh, in Spanish, and in French. Okay. Now, have you, uh, are you planning at all to uh, consider um, uh, having, uh, you know, remote physicians assist, like in the case that you mentioned earlier of a, of a dermatologist who is overwhelmed with uh, uh, work that he is not truly trained for, what if he has access to, you know, a, a physician, a remote physician, an emergency medicine physician who can lead him through uh you know, certain cases right there somehow. Yes, good point. All of our modules uh, advise uh, referral first. In other words, we don't want someone using an MCRA video to conduct procedures that they are not entirely comfortable with unless it's an absolute emergency and there is no trained practitioner available, which was the case in Japan and is the case in China in a lot of the issues we're dealing with. But each module also carries a caveat. If there is a trained practitioner in this area available, please refer and utilize that position and let them know uh, of our service that's also available and we can exchange uh, any information that they, uh, they need as well. Okay, so then I'm understanding that, that yours is a video module solution for giving some basic background to a potential and surrogate physician um, as opposed to enabling additionally real-time video of a specifically trained physician to help walk them through is not necessarily no we are uh, we are in the process of launching real-time telemedic telemedicine as well so that if someone is carrying on a procedure they can real-time interact with uh, one of our specialists uh, in the New York area that that is in in development right now. I'd like to I'd love to hear more about that and, and what you're using to do that. Yeah, I was going to say, Roger. I noticed on your website the LifeBot. Uh, I don't know if you wrote about that, but it's it's kind of a telemedicine unit, right, Roger? Where it and it's for designed for disaster areas, right? Specifically, yes. Um, it's probably one of the best modules out there and uh, designed specifically for field work very robust, um, but what it does is uh, enable that real-time interactive communication. So your physician has as much information about uh, the patient from the standpoint of being able to see and hear them, yes, but additionally any uh, heart monitoring, blood pressure, uh, oxygen levels in the blood, whatever uh, they might be trying to monitor or able to monitor, that information is also readily available as if the physician was actually at the location uh, with you. Um, so tools like that, have you been engaging those sort of things or are you this is creating your own Elliot, solution? Yeah, this is something that Elliot's been involved in. That's see, right. I, mean, I, I also, also have been involved in the general community of Internet of Things, which is uh, remote sensing and being able to transmit that, analyze it, analyze the location, replay it as needed, and so on and so forth. And again, we're very, very early in terms of the way we're thinking about it, but I'm part of the uh, I'm part of several groups that are actually working on various initiatives along this line. What we found is that there is so much uptake of the, uh, let's say, archivable right. video library that it's almost a different uh, orientation from what we're doing. Uh, we found that uh, a lot of these modules are used again and again and again uh, as reference. Um, so in some cases, the initial use of the module will be uh, in uh, January and we'll find it being accessed again in December and then it'll peak again the following March so there is a uh, there's a continuing demand for the static element of it but we also felt that particularly in the case of acute emergencies we really need to have a real-time uh, telemedicine presence as well particularly with our faculty who are interested in uh, participating in that uh, component of it and we have a few as well right the other thing that's happened is that we, there's a cultural sh shift taking place around the world in terms of students getting used to the idea that they have lectures that are pre-recorded and are able to look at it again and again and again. So it's not only sort of the technology that we're pushing 
but also the, the cultural use and the, the comfort people have yeah, which in terms was, of looking at these these sorts and just reviewing it. And it, it's fascinating because it brings up another cultural issue that, again, would not automatically occur to people, and that's that in a number of the East Asian countries that we've been working in particularly, there's a certain degree of national pride in their uh, uh, in the medical profession to the extent that we find people are extremely gratified by the fact that these modules are available in their native language by countrymen, so to speak. And uh, there has been a little bit of pushback on the telemedicine aspect. In other words, just teach us and we can handle it ourselves. Now, uh, one of the, but of course we haven't abandoned that because we've also found that we have a case in Vietnam with our rural medicine program where physicians are actually more or less going out into the bush and seeing uh, situations that um, they're not prepared for. And in that case, we really do need to have an expert on hand for live telemedicine. But um, in general, there is, as Elliot says, this interesting uh, cultural aspect of it that just teach us in our native language and we can handle it. Yeah, yeah, I think culturally you're going to run into that uh, quite a bit. Um, you also mentioned that you do PTSD uh, work um, and I wonder if you're saying you're doing modules or you're doing that in a live face-to-face uh, -face with the patient uh, no, through the system. Yeah, it's a good point. These are modules and the reason that they're modules is uh, again sort of a socio-cultural type thing. Uh, the reason that that is one of our primary domestic programs is confidentiality. Uh, a tremendous number of veterans and uh, law enforcement people and uh, actually uh, what we used to call G-men, <laughs> government <laughs> agents, who have been through some really horrendous experiences and are in fact suffering from uh, clinical PTSD, do not want anyone to know about this. So, and, and again, we, we drilled down into this by uh, actually talking to some of these people and some of the uh, organizations. Um, they encounter a lot of, and speaking about veterans only, they encounter a lot of difficulties dealing with the Veterans Administration because of the bureaucracy involved, because of the paperwork involved, and because of the overflow. Uh, they are reluctant to go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist because, in a sense, it's an admission that they have a severe problem that requires a psychiatrist or a psychologist. So what we're finding is that the greatest benefit of the IMCRA program is by providing background and insights to some of the first line responders to a uh, admitted or not admitted problem of PTSD. And what we've discovered is that occasionally these will turn out to be family members, concerned family members, clergymen, and in so many cases, primary care physician. That uh, the wife or the child or the grandson, whatever it happens to be, says, why, you know, why don't you go see Dr. Smith, you know, you haven't been sleeping, so on and so forth, you're having these, um, these nightmares, etc., etc. And Dr. Smith, who's a GP, is not going to know what's involved in PTSD and an initial approach to PTSD and in a therapeutic approach or indeed any level of prophylaxis, and they're going to generally refer to the VA or to another uh, psychiatrist or psychologist, in which case the patient is more than likely to let it drop. So what we're doing with the INCRA system, and this is in consultation with our chairman uh, who is connected with the VA in Boston, um, is that we are providing a confidential uh, level of access both for the patient's family and their primary care provider to some expert advice as to what to do if you don't want to go to the VA and you don't want to go see a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but ultimately maybe you should. Have you, um, have you engaged in this area with anything um, dealing with virtual reality as a mechanism and tool for working through PTSD? Um, yeah. Skip Rizzo has, has done a tremendous amount of work in that area and others and uh, has been tremendously effective and it takes that element of that unknowing who I'm talking to out of it because as you know it, it, it embeds them in the environment and then re-walks them through. Right, so this is something I that's actually... Yours. That's, that's, that's yours. That's yeah. right. We, 
we've looked at it. We've contact. Uh, uh, we, he's we very interested, in, incidentally. Leo Avalon is right. one of our He's very interested in the virtual reality aspect of it. Right, and also we've been active in, in terms of some of the initiatives. So Google has a has a uh, project called Project Tango, for instance, that's looking at virtual reality and what they call augmented reality. So it's something where we haven't really made plans in terms of incorporating it, but we are staying on top of the technology. Right. We we understand the capabilities, and at some point, when the when it, the uh, at an opportune time, we will start employing it. Right. It's still but very, right now where we're very we're new being... technology, and a lot of lot really really is people are still exploring the software at some very very basic level. It's, it's good stuff, and what we're doing is now referring uh, our audience to the technology that it, that exists at present. In other words, if you want to take take advantage of this, this is where you start looking, this is what you do, et cetera, et cetera. We do, by the way, have plans to incorporate this into uh, MCRIS functions itself, and that's something that uh, Dr. Alan is looking at. Right. The other thing, too, also is that, uh, that also I'm an experienced app developer. So I've looked yeah. at uh, I'm I'm sort of playing around with it on the periphery of that. Currently, I've not developed anything from a medical application, but have actually done some work in terms of game development. Yeah, it's it's very helpful in that regard, and it takes some of the stigmatization out of uh, out of dealing with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tom, T, uh, Tom, and uh, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, Elliot. Elliot, <laughs> Elliot. I'm sorry. Um, what what areas what areas of the world you've been to? Japan. Any other areas of the world that you have the IMCRA? Uh, IMCRA is now, as I said, IMCRA is now uh, operational in uh, China. Okay. In uh, the Guangzhou area of China, particularly, we're uh, on a joint program with Shenzhen dealing with the epidemic of diabetes, which is uh, uh, really, uh, it's epidemic in that part right. of China. It's a real problem. Uh, we're also collaborating with Bak Mai Hospital in um, Vietnam, and uh, we've been working with Department of Endocrinology and uh, Perinatal Medicine over there. Uh, we're uh, working in Indonesia as well, out of Bogor, Indonesia, with Bogor University. Um, in Thailand, we're collaborating with ADPC, which is the Asian Disaster Preparedness Council out of Bangkok. And um, let's see, we're, oh, in Korea, the Korea uh, is the one place we don't actually have an office, but Dr. Benedict Sung Ho Kim who is uh, operating out of New York, uh, has his own connections in Korea. So uh, that is, uh, that's a connection there. But um, in terms of West Africa, we're also working with the Imani House uh, in terms of uh, programs for uh, Ebola and infectious disease control in uh, Senegal and Sierra Leone. They're, they're all uh, educational videos or some of them live telemedicine? Um, the live components, we've had one, we've had actually two live seminars in West Africa. We have, uh, we've had two programs already, uh, actually, no, no, three, with, um, with the Shenzhen uh, team uh, in China. And uh, we're actually coming up on the fourth colloquium in, uh, in Japan. I'd like to actually put in a plug for that. Um, we are, we found it's now been five years since the uh, tsunami. And um, one of the things that uh, is in danger of falling through the cracks is the experiences, the personal experiences of the nurses and physicians who have longitudinally worked with the survivors of that uh, event of uh, 3.11.11. And um, it's very important information because uh, it's a long-term analysis of the stresses both they go through as caregivers and the development of the uh, psychological as well as physical stresses the um, survivors have gone through. And it turns out that that's fairly important because we have people who seem to have recovered entirely uh, from the loss of family members and from the loss of their home and uh, from physical injuries and then they go out and hang themselves. We've had uh, physicians who have been part of uh, this initiative who have um, uh, gone out and drowned themselves because they, they can't live with it anymore. Uh, and we're finding that a lot of this doesn't come to the fore. Uh, people, are, particularly in Japan, are reluctant to talk about this. But yet, this information, the five-year longitudinal uh, interaction and what realizations have come over time is a very, very important body of data 
and we've already gotten a uh, preliminary agree to publish from uh, the Journal of Disaster Medicine uh, on the outcome of uh, 50 to 75 uh, uh, professional caregivers who are going to be meeting in Sendai, Japan on the 31st of July of this year at the TKP conference hall. So that is going to be one of our on-site programs. We'll have an address by uh, Mitsuru Suzuki from the regional government, as well as uh, Hiroaki Hama and a number of other um, rather prominent physicians who have worked with this population. But basically, we're going to be collecting the firsthand stories, the anecdotal realities of uh, dealing with patients over this uh, span of time who have survived one of the most horrendous uh, disasters that has befallen a civilized nation within recent times. Mohammed, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, yeah, well, actually, uh, I've been really uh, interested in, in the regulation kind of uh, regulation aspects in implementing all this uh, uh, technology. And is there any barriers that has been faced going through different countries? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, we encountered that in China. Uh, China, uh, we have not been able to establish IMCRA's office in uh, Shanghai or in uh, actually chosen not to because China has some very stringent rules about um, what a foreign in, how a foreign NGO can operate in China. As a result, as I mentioned before, we're working with a native Chinese NGO, the Dai Group, out of Shenzhen Medical University, and we've basically circum navigated the regulations that way because we work with them in a very close collaboration and they are, as far as the Chinese government is concerned, um, they are 100% uh, uh, legit. So, and they're not encountering any of the difficulties. So in other words, they can apply for grants, they can um, uh, prosecute their programs throughout China and uh, they will be with the blessing of the regional governments. If we attempted to do that as an international NGO, albeit UN affiliated, would have a lot of problems. So what we generally find, this is also the case in Vietnam, we uh, just find that it's better to operate with the uh, Shenzhen Medical University or Bak Mai Hospital rather and establish our, our on-site office through our collaborators there than to open an independent IMCRA office in Vietnam or in China. I just have a quick question. Uh, are you working with the organization, uh, the Asia Foundation, to help make some inways uh, out there as well? Uh, not Asia Foundation per se. We've been working with uh, Give to Asia. We've been working with the uh, Japan Medical Society. We've been working with the uh, um, uh, Vietnamese, uh, oh geez, I forgot the name of it, the Rad Kivets organization. It's uh, 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 Vima uh, in Vietnam. And uh, we ha actually had a lot of, uh, a lot of good interactions with these folks. Um, we're also collaborating, uh, actually Androvic, one of our uh, interns, is now working with uh, Medical Teams International. I had done some work for Medical Teams International uh, some years ago, and we're collaborating now on basically what's in, uh, turns out to be an online encyclopedia of uh, uh, medical disaster management. Simon, you're quiet. Do you have any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for listening intently. I, uh, uh, I I was here uh, when the earthquake hit, um, and uh, at that time uh, uh, there was a lot of confusion. The internet went down for a short while, but it came up very quickly. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist, a bilingual clinical psychologist at the university here, and but we had no means to connect with anyone, and it was very frustrating. Uh, I have some other psychologist friends, and we were not able to do anything. There was no network set up, so it was the idea was. Uh, considered to bring in people, uh, well, physicians or psychologists, but then there was the question of reciprocity and the licensing issues, and as, as has been brought up in the Hangout, um, that uh, Japan likes to deal with it themselves, to learn how to deal with it, to learn uh, the technology or the ideas and then to handle it themselves. And so if there was a, had been um, uh, something that we could participate at that time, I would have loved to have participated, so I'm really excited to hear about this and to learn more about what you're doing. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry that we weren't <laughs> available at the time. Uh, this could be more, uh, I would say if you look at uh, Kokoro no Care, which is mm. associated with Fukushima Medical University, 
that mm. is one of our collaborating groups that is uh, now operating on the ground. And I think they, they have a oh. facility um, in uh, just outside of uh, Fukushima. In fact, um, oh. when I talk to John later, I can I can give you their address. Oh, yes. But that's, uh, that's uh, Kokoro no Care was um, one of the things that we set up initially, and uh, Dr. Uh, Shinichi Niwa mm -hmm. uh, was the uh, driving force behind that at uh, FMU. Well, we don't have a, uh, a good network uh, among psychologists in Japan. Uh, there have been some organizations that started, but I uh, uh, don't really have a good communications. But uh, if something like your organization was able to bring everyone together, it would be fantastic uh, if we knew where to connect. But there was just a big question mark. We didn't know what to do. Um, and I'm at the, uh, well, probably the largest uh, teaching uh, university for psychology, clinical psychology, Japan University of Tsukuba. And uh, we have a big center for training, but you know we were just sitting. I'm the only uh, uh, English uh, speaker there, a bilingual speaker there. But again, mm -hmm. uh, not which we could do. Um, so I really look forward to learning more about your organization. By all means. And we will uh, we'll make sure to get information to you. And if you're Thank in you. Scuba uh, by yeah. Shinkansen, it's uh, as you know, it's only about an hour and a half to two uh, hours yes. up to Sendai. So you're yeah. cordially invited on the 31st oh, of you. July. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you. Well, what do you foresee happening? Are you guys ready to go into any future disasters right away, or do you kind of have to wait a little bit till things settle down? Uh, I would say that uh, our, like the Boy Scouts, our uh, motto is be prepared. So okay. we are continually building up, uh, recruiting faculty and building up as much of a, uh, a library of uh, different therapeutic areas um, and uh, experts in those areas as we can, particularly in the case of the refugee situation we're dealing with now in Croatia and Jordan. Um, Dr. Anwar Saud, who was uh, one of our um, coordinators for this, uh, identified a number of physicians in multiple therapeutic areas, uh, and these being areas that were identified by uh, United Nations and WHO as uh, particularly lacking in appropriate medical care in these uh, camps, and I should say in responding to your question about disasters, that is one of the greatest ongoing, continuing, and expanding disasters that we're dealing with right now is the influx of refugees from North Africa and from the Middle East. So uh, we are indeed uh, at the present time trying to build up as much of an arsenal of uh, educational resources as we can. Excuse me, please. Okay. Right. One of the things that also we're that uh, we are pushing more and more aggressively into is is uh, not only having web web delivery but also making sure that mobile delivery is done specially and especially adapted to whatever circumstances we we feel make it make it special in terms yeah. of having being able to not only have a have the information available in a clinical setting but also out on the field if needed. Yes, and again, that's one of the designs uh, behind the Android-based uh, access system. Uh, it navigates very easily, and it navigates in both English and the native language. So basically, you're going to identify a main therapeutic area. Uh, let's say it's uh, cardiovascular. Is it cardiovascular trauma? Is it uh, um, lack of medications over some time? Is it an acute infarction? Is it uh, some level of a, a stroke? Or are we seeing... You know, whatever it happens to be, uh, you can navigate to that area very quickly and then within a few seconds access the module. You can do it either in English or you can do it in, uh, in uh, the native language. And that is uh, usable on the Android system, which it turns out the majority of uh, East Asia in particular is using. Yeah. In uh, the case of uh, disasters, you've got a lot of downed uh, communication infrastructure. Um, how are you or are you? Uh, dealing with getting infrastructure or signal in to these locations uh, during these crises in order to deliver this? Well, again, one of the things that uh, I have to note and keep coming back to is that very often when there's an acute disaster, you have a lot of response. So uh, we found this in Japan as well. You had Doctors Without Borders coming in, MTI coming in, even as uh, IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, came in and set up uh, a number of clinics. So the acute, the acute issues are dealt with fairly well. Um, we have generally found that the greatest value of IMCRA is the long-term availability of this uh, uh, information. And when I say long-term, sometimes only a few days after the disaster. But as was mentioned in Japan, 
uh, GP3 systems, GP4 systems tend to come up again fairly quickly and be restored even in, in remote areas and we were surprised at the degree to which that uh, carrier signals are available. So uh, the system is, is accessible and even in the worst level of disaster, generally the carrier s system comes up again within a few days. I know that in areas like Nepal and all those that you had mentioned earlier, something like Nepal where the infrastructure is non-existent um, and you have uh, tribes that hike five days to get to a village where there's some kind of communication, uh, maybe ten days if they're going to get to a real town, um, spread out throughout the regions and, uh, if, uh, and not in a disaster capacity but just in a general, we're going to provide you with, with these modules and we're going to provide you with how to, uh, to tend to these things. We've got good regions experience like that. With that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have first Dr. Kadam Neopane, who is uh, our Nepalese uh, faculty member, actually uh, uh, went into some of these areas with a stock of uh, uh, infra modules uh, for the uh, for to uh, uh, disseminate uh, on memory stick to some of the local providers and whatnot. And actually, we also have print uh, elements as well. But uh, Dr. Neopane, I wish we had him here now. He could tell you firsthand about that. Yeah. That was in Nepal immediately after the earthquake. You know, you said something surprising to me that the acute care is pretty well taken care of. The what is? The acute care, you mentioned that the acute care is pretty well taken care of. I'm, that speaking, rel I'm speaking relatively. When you have a, uh, when you have a large scale disaster covering a huge area like Tohoku, yeah, the, the uh, acute care groups fly in, but there are just too many people to take right. care of. And it's just too much. So uh, initially, in some of the major centers like in Sendai, in Tezanuma, in uh, Miyako initially, and in some of the other uh, areas, you did have a number of, of people setting up camps. But what we generally found is after a week or two weeks, they would pack up and they would leave. Oh, okay. And then the only one left was going to be Imkra. Right. Haiti, was, was Haiti was something like that as well when Haiti had their earthquake. Yeah, it was the same thing in Haiti. We same weren't really... Yeah, we weren't. Um, we didn't get into Haiti because we had a number of uh, a number of issues with uh, actually getting people over there we, and getting the infrastructure set up over there. But yeah, Haiti is another good example of, of that kind of situation. Uh, is there anywhere we can see some of these modules, uh, or uh, you know, are they available online? Or? Yeah, sure, absolutely. What we can do is um, uh, we're uh, relaunching the main library. And that's going to come up probably within a month. Um, and we're also just uh, essentially days away from launching the uh, refugee program. So um, what we will be more than delighted to do is provide you with links and access to uh, the modules themselves and to other functionalities within the infra system. Right, but right now we're in a major upgrade. Yeah, we're, we're, this is exactly it. We've just collected, uh, in fact, as of last week, uh, we've collected the last of our Arabic-speaking um, modules for the uh, refugees in Jordan, and uh, Elliot's sort of in the final stages of getting that uh, that system, that platform up. We just yesterday renewed with our primary carrier, Vizar, and uh, this uh, should be available uh, for. Uh, we're actually going to launch the site and make it available in the camps uh, before the end of the month. Do you find in these areas that uh, the word, uh, how does the word get around that these are available, the modules are available? Is that's, it you strictly word of mouth uh, in a disaster no, no, area? Well, no, that's the benefit of working with uh, uh, the United Nations because we can then access uh, uh, field workers through UNICEF, through the peacekeeping forces, through the uh, WHO itself, and also our collaborations with Medical Teams International where they'll basically carry either a scan code or um, direct access link to the infra site so that uh, people know about it. And we also find that it spreads by word of mouth very quickly too. Uh, you know, the people will pass around the flyers and they'll uh, mention it to each other and uh, uh, eventually word spreads around quite a bit. I mean, we saw that, we, we were amazed by the response uh, in Korea recently because as you recall there was a um, major disaster with a ferry that overturned a lot of uh, kids were lost on that with their families and this actually had a major impact on South Korea so um, 
Uh, we had Dr. Kim and a colleague come in and uh, record a number of modules for that, and the, the hits were overwhelming. We, we were just shocked by that. So clearly, uh, and we were not advertising it, so clearly this was spreading by word of mouth, or people were on social media sending the links to each other, and uh, they were just getting hit after hit after hit. It was astounding on that one. Right, but in, in terms of the, uh, you know, we are uh, uh, ramping up our exposure in terms of social media, other various types of out, out, um, outlets, chat rooms, et cetera, et cetera. But something is still a work in progress. Well, we yeah, just yeah, we just, to... we just hired two new people who are working with that in terms of uh, updating Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, our main uh, site, which is the uh, Imcra blog, and also the um, Global Giving Foundation, where we have major representation as well. Yeah, yeah, Imcra.net, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, how do you access the physicians to do the modules? How do you get a hold of the physicians to do them? <laughs> it's called the Good Old Boy Network. <laughs> good old. I use, yeah, I yeah. use some of my uh, colleagues from Einstein, and they refer people from Mount Sinai and. Uh, and I should mention that Dr. Robert Yanagasawa in the Department of, uh, I believe it's endocrinology, uh, he's a thyroid specialist at Mount Sinai, uh, has been instrumental in identifying colleagues uh, to work um, uh, with IMCRA who are specialists in different areas. Uh, and again, some of it is just straight outreach. Uh, we contacted Oak Ridge Radiation Center to get uh, specialists uh, to bring to Japan for one of our colloquia on the um, on the uh, uh, TEPCO reactor. Uh, as you know, there was a lot of hysteria about the exposure to uh, radiation and people were finding cobalt-90 and so on and so forth, which actually turns out to be um, residue fallout from the uh, nuclear tests of the 50s that were being found on the top of buildings. So uh, we needed to do a little bit of uh, hysteria control in that area. But uh, it's both uh, networking, uh, outreach, uh, word of mouth, and um, sometimes just uh, uh, contacting people cold. And then occasionally we'll have a, a, a real break, like with Dr. Uh, Saud, who uh, was able to bring his entire network to bear. And that's how we got uh, pulmonologists, uh, gastroenterologists, uh, infectious disease specialists, et cetera, et cetera. We're also working fairly closely with Johns Hopkins um, Continuing Medical Education Group. And people are, uh, I have to hand it to Johns Hopkins, they're falling all over themselves to uh, to help out. Right. Now, you mentioned in a prior conversation that the majority of physicians are from New York, correct? Um, I would say that the reason for that, and, and I would guess when, when you think of everybody, I mean, we got modules by Miwa, we got uh, um, Neopane, we've got uh, Shoham. Uh, no, they, they, they're pretty much international, um, but uh, the majority, I'd say it's maybe 60% New York, 40%, uh, or when I say New York, I mean the Philadelphia, New York, uh, Boston axis, axis there, so to speak. And the reason is that there are a lot of immigrant uh, physicians uh, in that East Coast area that you wouldn't find in other areas of the U.S., so we're doubly blessed in that regard. It's not that difficult to find a Nepalese-speaking physician uh, after the earthquake in Nepal. We were able to do that fairly quickly. Uh, should there be, and again, you know, um, God forbid, uh, and uh, a serious problem in uh, Cambodia that required uh, uh, medical intervention, I doubt that we would have too much problem finding a well-trained physician we spoke Cambodian in the New York area. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, very good. Any uh, any closing questions or remarks, uh, Gene or Roger or Simon? Well, I think the, this was a great discussion. Very good. Very good. And thanks so much for your valuable insights. I appreciate it. Yeah. Th yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we hope we can get the word about your great organization. And I'm sure that it's not hard to get physicians because I think most physicians will be glad to do it. Yeah, they are. Yes, uh, and please, please pass on the links once uh, you've upgraded the system. We'd like to uh, publicize them and promote that. By all means. And we're welcome to speak back. Okay. Okay. So anyone out there, it's mcra.net. 
uh, that'll tell about the organization. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out, uh, especially Thomas and Elliot. And thank you for the panelists. And uh, good night. Night. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Take care. Okay.